A crisis can sometimes be a positive thing because it acts as a catalyst for change and it makes us improve the way we do things. It may be that this pandemic acts as such a catalyst which brings modern monetary theory into the mainstream. So in this video we'll look at modern monetary theory to see how it differs from the way we currently do things. Now if you do want to keep abreast of what's going on and to learn about economics and investment, what better way could there be than to sign up for our weekly market roundup? There'll be a link in the description below and above me. So let's look at modern monetary theory in a bit more detail. This is not a recommendation. If you want advice tailored to your specific circumstances, seek independent financial advice. The ideas behind modern monetary theory have been around for a long time. But if you haven't done so already, I strongly recommend you take a look at The Deficit Myth by Stephanie Kelton. In just eight chapters, she explains very intuitively how MMT works. And of course, she's just representing one side of the argument, but she does it very eloquently. And personally, I really enjoyed reading the book. A good place to start with MMT is something called the household fallacy, which is the idea that budgeting for a government is exactly the same as budgeting for a household, which is to say that you can't spend more than you earn. Even Thomas Jefferson, in this letter in 1816, said that he doesn't like the idea of debt because it has to be paid by posterity and is effectively swindling futurity on a large scale. Before she was married, Margaret Thatcher was called Margaret Roberts, and when she was accepted into the Conservative Party in 1949, she said that the government should effectively do what a housewife does if money is short, which is to look at the accounts and see what was wrong. And in 2009, in the wake of the global financial crisis, Barack Obama channeled Thomas Jefferson when he said that the US shouldn't settle for a future of rising deficits and debts, which our children cannot pay. And politicians sometimes talk about paying off the debt, as Donald Trump did before he was president in 2016 when he said he intended to eliminate the national debt in the US in just eight years, which would have meant paying off $19 trillion worth of US treasuries. And Nikki Haley, who may well run as a presidential candidate in future, obviously wants to establish her credentials by saying that debt is a recipe for economic collapse and American decline. The only difference between right-wing and left-wing politicians is how they intend to reduce the debt with those to the political right usually wanting to reduce spending, as Nikki Haley does here, whereas the political left usually wants to raise taxes on the rich, reduce military spending, or raise taxes generally, in order to balance the books. But to get ourselves into the mood for MMT, there's this great quote from Margaret Thatcher when she was at the height of her power in 1983, when she said the state has no source of money other than the money which people earn themselves and that there's no such thing as public money, there's only taxpayers' money. But this idea of household debt crops up again and again. So here's George Osborne in 2009 saying that Gordon Brown, who is then leader of the Labour Party, is maxing out the nation's credit card. And then when he became Chancellor in 2010, he started off a huge programme of austerity, which meant cutting government expenditure by a very large amount with the belief that this would be a hard road, but it would lead to a better future. Proponents of MMT point out that there's a big difference between currency users, which includes us and our households, but also companies and local governments, all of which have to balance their books. You can't indefinitely spend more than you earn without becoming insolvent. But some governments are not like us because they have the power to issue their own currency. Now notice that this only applies to central government, not to local government, which can't issue its own currency. Also, it doesn't apply to all countries. So for example, Eurozone countries can't print their own money, because that's now done by the European Central Bank, the ECB. But there are many countries which can issue their own currency, and that would include the US, the UK, Japan, and many others. Now, if you can issue your own currency, you can never become insolvent because you can just print more money. There are limits to how much you can print, as we'll see later, but effectively, it's impossible for the US to become bankrupt. How does that money actually get created 
Well, this is an interview with Ben Bernanke, who was then Fed chairman in 2010, talking about the way the US central bank, the Federal Reserve, created money in order to buy US government bonds as part of the quantitative easing program. He stresses that they don't use tax money for those purchases. In order to pay a bank for its treasuries, the banks have accounts with the Fed, that's called their reserves, so to lend to a bank, the Fed simply uses the computer to mark up the size of the account that they have with the Fed. In other words, there's someone on a keyboard who just types in the numbers, and the money is literally created out of bits and bytes. What's really different about MMT is that it reverses this centuries-old narrative which says that deficits, which is when the government spends more than it earns, are always bad. And austerity, when the government spends as little as possible, is always good. And the reasoning goes as follows. Imagine that we split spending in the economy into two buckets. The bucket on the left is the government and the bucket on the right is everyone else, which includes normal people, but also companies, and people and companies in other countries. Now, if the government spends $100, that transfers $100 from the government's bucket into the non-government bucket. And if $90 moves the other way via government taxes, then the government ends up with a $10 deficit. So the government is in the red. But because the numbers have to add up, the government's deficit means a $10 surplus for the rest of us. And those $10 could stimulate the economy, create more investment by companies, and be seen as a good thing. Or as Stephanie Kelton puts it, their red ink, that is the government's red ink, is our black ink. And in case you thought austerity, which is reducing the debt, was always a good thing, here's some data from Frederick Fair who's an MMT economist, who looked at the six largest debt reduction periods in US history. So these are the periods when the debt reduction happened. This is the amount by which debt was reduced. And without exception, there shortly followed an economic depression. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that the debt reduction caused the depression, because correlation isn't causation, but it certainly is suggestive. Because if we turn these cash flows around, then a surplus for the government means a deficit for the rest of us. And the government is therefore draining money out of the economy. So let's imagine for a moment that government deficits are a good thing. How can we ensure that government debt doesn't get out of control? Usually we measure a country's debt relative to the country's income, which is its GDP. And that's the value of all the goods and services that the country produces over the course of one year. So let's imagine a country where the debt is 10 trillion and the GDP is also 10 trillion then that would be a debt-to-GDP ratio of 100%. In order to keep that number stable, if debt grows by 10% in one year, well, that's not necessarily a problem, as long as the country's GDP also grows at 10%. Because remember that the government's tax receipts, or its income, is proportional to GDP. But if government debt grows by 5% and GDP grows by 10%, in other words, the economy is growing faster than the debt, then the debt-to-GDP ratio will reduce over time. Now, the amount by which the government debt increases in one year depends on just three numbers. The cost of servicing the debt, so that's the amount of debt that a country has, multiplied by the average rate of interest that the government pays on that debt. Then we'd have to add the spending by the government in that year, and subtract the government's income primarily through taxes. And the difference between spending and income is called the primary balance. So as long as these three numbers on the right-hand side are less than the monetary growth in GDP in one year, then you could actually have a fiscal deficit which is sustainable. So MMT economists, such as James Galbraith, point out the prudent policy for central banks is to keep the projected interest rate as low as possible. And here he shows a very simple projection where you start off at a high debt-to-GDP ratio of 100%, but because real growth is higher than the real interest rate, the debt-to-GDP ratio is not only sustainable, but it's also falling over time, and is paying down the debt despite a 3% primary deficit. During the Second World War, when the US government needed to raise its debt-to-GDP significantly, it was the job of the Federal Reserve to do something called yield curve control, where they committed to buying unlimited quantities of treasuries in order to keep short-term interest rates below three-eighths of a percent, but also long-term treasuries below 2.5%. 
and that way the government could ensure that it could service its debt and grow out of the very large debt to GDP ratio. And in 2020, the Japanese central bank is doing exactly that because Japan's debt to GDP is over 200%. And in theory, during times of crisis, as we have now, the Fed could do this again. So what is this relationship between the level of government debt and inflation? This is an account of a conversation between J.F. Kennedy and one of his economic advisors called James Tobin. In this informal conversation behind closed doors, JFK was asking whether there's any economic limit on the size of the debt relative to GDP. And he says, there isn't, is there? That's just a political answer. And he asks, what is the limit? And Tobin replies that the only limit is inflation. And JFK, who sounds a bit like a closet mmt -er, replies, that's right, isn't it? The deficit can be any size. The debt can be any size provided they don't cause inflation. Everything else is just talk. Which makes me wonder if other politicians have made this realisation but simply aren't brave enough to actually say so in public. Now after the financial crisis, central bank balance sheets grew immensely, both in Europe, and here we've got European inflation, and in the US. So this is US inflation. Now bear in mind that the target for inflation by central banks is usually 2%, which I've marked with this red dashed line. Now the narrative that I remember in 2011 was that everybody was talking about the amount of money printing being done by the central bank, the Fed, and also by the ECB, and the accepted wisdom was that this would be hugely inflationary. And although inflation did go above 2%, both in Europe and in the US, it certainly didn't stay there. In fact, what characterises the decade after the financial crisis is that inflation was actually below target and central banks were struggling to get inflation back up to that 2%, despite massive bond buying programmes all over the world. So it turned out that this narrative, which was almost certain that we were going to get hyperinflation, was completely false. And that in turn suggests that our understanding of inflation and how to control it are seriously flawed. And yet all central banks across the world have stuck to this 50-year-old theory, which we'll describe in a minute. Another difference between MMT and more conventional thought is how you go about fighting inflation. The 50-year-old theory that I was talking about is based on the concept of NIRU, which is, brace yourself, the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. It's a very complicated name for quite a simple concept. So here in red, I've shown the Federal Reserve's estimate of US NIRU, and it roughly tracks the average rate of unemployment. And I've shown US unemployment in blue on the same axis. During periods when unemployment is very high, there's said to be a lot of slack in the labour market. So if you imagine that there are a hundred people who are qualified to do your job, well in that case it's very difficult to negotiate a pay rise, because your company could fire you and hire someone who's much cheaper. But during these periods when the unemployment dips below Nairu, that's a very tight labour market in which employees have a much stronger negotiating position to raise their wages. So the conventional theory is that when the unemployment rate is less than Nairu, workers can negotiate pay rises and that can create something called demand pull inflation. As people's salaries increase, they have more disposable income and companies respond to that greater demand for their goods and services by raising prices. But when I add inflation to that graph, which is the green line, during these periods when there's a very tight labour market, for example in 2019, the labour market was below Nairu. In other words, we'd overshot full employment, according to the Fed's definition, and yet there simply wasn't a huge spike in inflation. But it seems like the central banks around the world are completely ignoring the fact that their theory is fundamentally flawed. The trouble with Nairu is that it's impossible to estimate. Nobody really knows what the rate of unemployment is where inflation starts to kick in. So the Fed can always say, well, the value of Nairu was lower than we thought, rather than just admitting that the theory is flawed. And this makes life unbelievably difficult for the Fed. It's a little bit like navigating a sailing ship when you know it's really close to some rocks, but it's foggy and you don't know where those rocks are. Maybe you can hear the waves breaking on the rocks, but you can't see them. The Fed never really knows how close it is to Nairu, and that means that it has to raise interest rates 
before it hits the rocks, before it hits Nairu, which means that it could end up being scared of something which isn't even there. And the fact that it's willing to accept an unemployment rate of 5% means that there's a great deal of human suffering for those 1 in 20 people who, according to this theory, must remain unemployed in order to avoid inflation. So the Federal Reserve is very jumpy. And at the first sign of inflation, the natural thing to do is to raise interest rates as soon as possible. And Stephanie Kelton puts it very well. She says no matter how many people remain jobless, the Fed can claim it's done its best. And there's simply no way to reduce unemployment further without causing inflation. For those who are still without jobs, and remember that's 1 in 20 people at the moment, tough luck. There's also a problem with the Fed's control mechanism. When it thinks inflation's going to go higher because unemployment is approaching Nairu, then it'll raise interest rates. And people have compared this to taking away the punch bowl at a party when things get a little bit too rowdy. But how effective is this punch bowl? Do interest rates really work? Well, you can see after the global financial crisis that it took over five years for unemployment to get back to where it started. For much of that time, the Fed was acting alone after the initial flurry of bailout programs in 2009 and 2010. Of course, low interest rates help because people and companies can borrow more cheaply and it makes credit more easily available. But the question is, if the government had had a bigger deficit and spent more, would it have brought about a faster recovery? And the answer is almost certainly yes. So the MMT version of the control mechanism isn't about just interest rates. It's to do with fiscal policy rather than monetary policy, which means that when unemployment is higher, the government either cuts taxes or spends more. Now the type of tax cut is very important. When you increase the income of the most wealthy in society, they don't necessarily increase their expenditure significantly. So if a millionaire has another $10,000, is she going to rush to the mall and spend that money? Probably not. But for people with average or lower incomes, they're much more likely to go out and spend that extra disposable income. And that has a much bigger effect on the economy. Similarly, if you spend money, you have to rely on government to do that wisely. In other words, you spend it on something which has a high fiscal multiplier, which means that every dollar that you spend gets recycled in the economy multiple times and has a bigger positive effect on growth and employment. But if you are spending too much and inflation starts to rise, the MMT approach is to either raise taxes and or spend less because that removes money from the economy and should slow down inflation. So this is quite different to the current system, which depends almost completely on the central bank setting interest rates. Another Fed chairman from the past, Alan Greenspan, put it extremely well. He says there's nothing to prevent the federal government from creating as much money as it wants and paying it to somebody. The question is, how do you set up a system which creates the real assets which that money can buy? So instead of focusing so much on balancing the books, a government which uses MMT would focus much more on capacity utilisation. Capacity utilisation is what percentage of your existing capacity you're using in order to produce finished products. A good mental image to have is imagine a factory which has 100 machines. If the capacity utilisation is 50%, then it's only using half of those machines. And if demand increases, it can service that demand by just switching on more of those machines. And that doesn't cost it much more money. Whereas in the 60s, the US was much closer to 100% utilisation. In which case, to create more goods and services, it would have had to expand its existing infrastructure, which would have been very expensive and inflationary. Now, fortunately, capacity utilisation is much easier to measure than a fairly airy concept like Nairu, where generally no two economists can agree on the same number. So in a way, this understanding of inflation would be easier to implement than the one we've got now. It's interesting to look at the objections against MMT. And the one which upsets people the most, and which is highlighted in this note from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, is whether countries can borrow in their own currency 
and not worry about government deficits. And in this not very scientific survey of economists, 88% of the economists that were surveyed disagreed with this concept, which is fairly central to MMT. And later in the research note, the authors say that if a country has a high level of unsustainable debt and they print money, then this could lead to extremely high rates of inflation or even hyperinflation and often ends in economic ruin. But I think that misunderstands how MMT actually works. As we've already seen, MMT economists have thought very hard about how to control inflation if the deficit gets too large and the increased demand for goods and services exceeds the capacity of the economy to generate those goods and services. What I think is ironic about this objection as well is that it perfectly describes what the Federal Reserve was doing in 2009 and afterwards, which is the massive program of quantitative easing. So MMT is quite different from the current dialogue which we have when we're talking about crises, but also about government spending. And the next time you hear someone say, but how are you going to pay for it? You'll be able to say MMT. If you enjoy our videos and you want to support us, then you can do that really easily by going to Patreon. There's a link above me on this page. And if you do that, you get access to lots of great stuff. You can ask questions of me and other members of the community via this application for chatting to each other called Slack. We also have a very friendly, regular call on a Sunday evening where you can ask any question you like and I answer them live. There's also a video replay which is available afterwards. And we have a growing library of explainers which are exclusively for our members. And you can see two of the latest examples of that here beside me. And alongside the video, you also get access to the notes so that you can research each topic in more detail yourself. So if you do want to join us or just support us, then click on that Patreon symbol on the far side of the page. It would be wonderful to see you as part of the community. And as always, thank you for listening.